Welcome to the semi-virtual Lubar Center. Uh, I'm Alan Borsick. I'm a senior fellow here at Marquette Law School, and we're joined by the director of the Marquette Law School poll, uh, Professor Charles Franklin. I say semi-virtual in that we are actually in the Lubar Center, although we are taping this uh, for uh, release for uh, various logistical reasons. Um, and we will have a uh, conversation here about the new Marquette uh, National Survey of uh, Issues, particularly focusing on the Supreme Court, and then be releasing uh, uh, sub, uh, the next day, which would be Thursday uh, this week, on uh, September 22nd, um, a additional results related to national uh, politics primarily. So welcome, Professor Franklin. And let's start with, uh, I guess, the usual, the mechanics of things. <laughs> so as with our national surveys, these are done with a uh, national sample of mailing addresses around the country. We select the sample from that, and then interviews are conducted online. We were in the field September 7th through the 14th, and the interviews included 1,448 adults uh, nationwide with a margin of error of plus or minus 3.4 percentage points. We started doing these surveys largely focused on the U.S. Supreme Court in 2019. At first, we were going to do them once a year. Then we put it up to uh, every two months so we could really keep track. I think this is the 10th, am I right? This is the 10th, yes. And in the good old days, opinions of the Supreme Court were pretty positive overall, including across the spectrum politically. Mm, that seems to have changed. It has changed, and maybe just a little bit of the point you're making is, as recently as July of last year, July of 2021, there were only about three or four points that separated Democrats and Republicans in their job approval of the Supreme Court. And Democrats, Independents, and Republicans were all in the upper 50s or low 60s of approval and how things have changed. In that July of 2021 survey, 60% approved of the job the court was doing, 39% disapproved, and very little partisan difference. This time, 40% approve, 60% disapprove, quite a drop. Um, in July this year, immediately after the court ended its term with its final decisions, approval was 38% and disapproval 61 So not very much change from June until now. And partisan differences are larger than they used to be. Which we will get into. Uh, as a separate but related question, we asked people how much confidence they had in the uh, work of the Supreme Court? We often talk about the idea of court legitimacy, and, and Justice Roberts just recently talked about that in, a, in public remarks. Uh, we measure approval of the court with the idea that that says, how are they doing their job right now? But confidence in the court as an institution is a question we ask along with the presidency and Congress and other, other institutions. Confidence also is down in the court, though. 30% uh, say they have a high level, either very high or quite a lot of confidence in the court. 36% say they have not much or no confidence at all in the court. So a net six points negative. There are some people in the middle who say some confidence. Um, but again, compare that with when we started the survey in September of 2019, just two years, three years ago now. Um, then it was 37 confident, 20 not confident. So you can see that on the confident side, it's gone down by about seven points. But on the not confident side, it's gone up 16. So quite a shift in the shift, especially among those folks saying they don't have much or any confidence in the court. What could possibly behind, be behind this? Perhaps the Dobbs decision. Exactly. And um, it's important to point out that not every decision the court rendered this summer was unpopular. 
Uh, we'll have an example of one that is more popular than not. But in the case of Dobbs, which struck down the Roe versus Wade precedent on abortion, we've seen substantial opposition to that decision. We saw it in the past year looking ahead to a possible striking down of Roe. And now post-decision, we see it sustained. 61% oppose striking down Roe, 30% favor. And that's not much changed from uh, June before the decision was handed down or May before the decision was handed down. Uh, and July, the immediate post-decision reaction was similarly negative. If anything, the percent saying they oppose the decision has gone up a point or so, but not much real movement there. So this is a case of the court having a very anticipated, very consequential decision where the public's preference was opposite what the court ruled, and I think it very clearly drives this shift in views of the court. And the abortion issue in one way or another has been before the court a lot in the past 12 months. When you think of the Texas law that went into effect and the court chose not to stay that law uh, or to prevent it from going into effect, that happened at the end of last summer and we saw it in the polling then as well. Awareness of the abortion decision and the issue of abortion is high. Uh, very high. You know, a lot of the things the court does are not noticed there. They might even make it on the front page of the paper, but they just don't rise in public salience. That's the not the case decidedly with this abortion decision. 84% say they've heard a lot about the abortion decision, 13% a little, and just 3% say they haven't heard anything about an abortion decision. Who are those people? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're uh, living in a cabin in Montana, but I'm not sure how we got them in the survey. Okay. Uh, that's slightly up, actually, in how much people have heard from July. 81% in July said they'd heard a lot. 83% now, that's not much of a difference. But normally with court decisions, you get an immediate spike in awareness when the decision's handed down, it's in the papers, it's talked about. And then people start to forget it as time goes on. Here's a case where that immediate response, 81%, has actually slightly built over the following month, two months. And so this is... Just, I think, an example of on this particular decision, it's had real staying power with the public, largely because, of course, it's had very big public policy implications, and it remains an important political issue in this election year. A second major decision from the end of the term has been following that classic uh, course a little bit more, and that's the Second Amendment case out of New York that involved the right to carry a gun outside of your home. Yes. This would normally classify as also a really important major decision. Uh, until this, the Supreme Court had said the Second Amendment protected a right to have a weapon in your home for self-defense. But this is the first time they've extended that to say it includes possession of a, of a weapon outside the home. Um, this is also the case of one where um, public opinion supports the court's ruling, but 38% are in favor of that ruling, 29% opposed. But unlike the abortion case, 33% say they haven't heard enough to have an opinion about this issue. So that level of awareness is different. In our previous polling, we've consistently seen more in favor than opposed. But somewhat oddly, in the spring, more people had an opinion about the gun issue. Now, in the wake of its decision, that percent, the 33 percent that say they haven't heard enough, has actually gone up a little bit over the summer. So maybe the ruling has been crowded out by other things. Maybe people's July and August vacations sort of pushed the court issues off the agenda, though it clearly didn't do that with abortion, 
but has with guns. We asked the same question, how much have you heard about the Second Amendment ruling? 31% have heard a lot. Contrast that with the 83 or 4% that have heard a lot about the uh, abortion ruling. 48% a little, 21% nothing at all. And there in July, 47% said they'd heard a lot. So there you do see the decline you mentioned from 47% a lot in July down to 31 now. This is a more classic case of an important ruling that's visible at the time, but then as it recedes in the past, people's awareness of the decision declines. We've been asking since the start of doing this three years ago how much people think public opinion should be a factor for the justices in their work. Yes. What's the trend on that? Well, it's really much higher saying that the court should attend to public opinion. In September of 2020, the first time we asked this, 44% said the court should consider public opinion in reaching its decision. 55% said the court should not consider public opinion. But now, in the wake of decisions, 61% uh, say the court should consider the public's views, 39% not. Now, there are nine people that say the court should not consider public opinion, and they all sit on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and so uh, this is not likely to change the justices' views. But it is interesting that in a two-year period here in which a major case was decided counter to public opinion, we're not just seeing a spike in this, but we've seen some growth over time and now continued growth in the public sense that the court should pay attention to the public. It being mid to late September, that means we're getting close to the start of October, which means we're getting close to the official start of the Supreme Court calendar. And more cases to come this year. We asked about some of them. Uh, Affirmative action in college admissions, for example. You know, I got to say, the Supreme Court is a little bit like elections. They run <laughs> on a regular cycle, so we always know we're going to get something new starting in October each year. Um, the more serious side are the things they will decide, or will hear at least this year. And one that's likely to be extremely prominent as it is heard is whether colleges, uh, or whether the court, should ban the use of race as a consideration in college admissions. Um, this is, of course, a long-standing issue, but now is, is before the court. They're ready to hear this case. 37% favor banning the use of race in admissions. Just 13% oppose a ban on the use of race. But here, fully half, 50%, say they haven't heard enough to have an opinion. So an open question is, will this case become very prominent as it is heard and argued in the fall and decided sometime between now and June? Um, or will it sort of linger in the background? This is a classic example of one that we would expect to become a much more prominent case one that people hear a lot about in the coming months. But as of right now, people don't have it at the top of their minds. They're not thinking about it. Having said that, we've asked this question multiple times over the last year or so, and a substantial plurality prefer banning the use of race in admissions. A small, smaller minority favor continuing to use race in admissions. And a substantial portion, 50% this time, say they don't know enough about the issue. So one question will be, how much do people learn about the issue? And what are the arguments for using race as well as the arguments against using race in admissions? A second hot button issue that's on the docket for the coming term for the court is uh, whether a business owner can uh, refuse services to uh, LGBTQ customers uh, based on religious beliefs. This is one of a series of cases we've seen over the last several years 
in which businesses argue that their owners' religious beliefs should allow them to make choices about who they serve. Um, and it's a struggle between religious liberty of the business owner and anti-discrimination against the customer or the would-be customer. Here, a plurality oppose allowing a religious exemption. 35% say businesses should not be able to refuse services to um, LGBTQ customers. 21% would favor allowing the business to do that. And 44% say they don't know enough to have an opinion on this. So here are two cases that will be argued soon that I think raise important questions, are likely to get some prominence when they're decided. But the public has uh, somewhat different views across these two cases and how the court comes down on them and how visibly and how much uh, that gets caught up in the public discussion will have a big influence when you see 50% or 44% that don't have opinions about these cases yet. In the broader context or the longer range context, there has been a lot of change in public opinion uh, nationwide in relation to gay and lesbian rights and so on. Uh, what did we find this time? It, and it is striking that on, on um, same-sex marriage and on a general employment discrimination ban for gay and lesbian and transsexual people, opinion is really lopsided. Um, in the case of same-sex marriage, 70 percent favor the court's decision that established a national right to same-sex marriage. Just 29 percent are opposed to that. And on the more recent decision about fed whether federal law bans discrimination against gay, lesbian, transsexual people in the workplace, 87% favor that anti-discrimination law, just 12% are opposed. So um, whether you look at this as a particular case of workplace discrimination or as a broader question of the right to marry, we have very large majorities on this. This is newly relevant because um, in the decision striking down Roe versus Wade, the majority opinion tried to say this opinion does not apply to some of these earlier decisions. But Justice Thomas, in his, in his concurring opinion, pointed specifically to some of these previous decisions as also now suspect. And so that's uh, just one justice on that uh, opinion. But it certainly raised the question of how far the arguments striking down Roe might be extended to other areas in these two cases concerning LGBTQ rights. And you can see that here the public is, if anything, even more in favor of sustaining those rights than it is in the case of abortion, where 61 percent wanted to see Roe versus Wade maintained. Here we're over 70 or even over 80 percent favoring the court's recent rulings. We asked a, a, a set of questions on perceptions of the court's work overall, the ide ideology of the court, and of individual justices, which we'll get to. But let's start with uh, perceptions of how the court has handled rights of a variety of specific groups over time here. Here we're interested in whether the perceptions of the public in Sort of the longer term, we ask it about over the last 15 years or so. We're not asking people what happened this year, but over the longer haul. Has the court expanded the rights of these groups? Has it restricted those rights? Or hasn't it changed things very much for them? And while the public in general is not deeply knowledgeable of the details of the court's decisions, I think you'll see a sort of it makes sense what people are saying here. 
First, on those seeking an abortion, just 8% think those rights have been expanded, 79% restricted, 12% no change. So uh, <laughs> under the circumstances, we'd be really worried if this turned out any different than that. Um, but the voting rights of racial and ethnic minorities, there it's about split. 28% think they've expanded, 28% think they've been reduced or restricted. Re rights of religious people and organizations, 39% uh, expanded, 20% restricted, 40% don't see uh, much change on that. <clears throat> this is a good one where there have been a series of court cases now over the last decade or so in which individual cases have specifically expanded religious liberty claims of various groups in various circumstances uh, involving schools and other kinds of uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, and the public had generally not seen that trend so clearly, but this time we're seeing uh, by a two to one margin, people seeing that those religious liberty claims have, have in fact been expanded recently rather than reduced. Um, contributors to political campaigns I'm, I'm mildly amused by. Uh, this is the, in part, the Citizens United case which opened the doors to a lot of campaign spending. 45% see that as having expanded just 22% think it's contracted or been reduced. And this is one where the court's ruling on this case is now quite a ways in the past. But the public still sees this expansion of the rights of campaign contributors, and I think they see it pretty clearly. Finally, expanding the rights of LGBTQ people, 60% see those as having expanded, 21% contracted. So, in a rough and ready way, I think these uh, rights claims of various types of people or groups line up reasonably well with the broad sweep of, of recent court rulings, though certainly not with respect to every single ruling. People's perception of the ideology of the court, we've been asking about that all along. And there's change on that front. Yeah, this one is so striking because the court um, recently, as recently as <coughs> September 2019, was seen as a more center, center right court. Now it's seen as much more solidly a conservative court. In this survey, 64% say the court is either very conservative or somewhat conservative. In September 2019, when we first asked this, just 38% saw the court as that conservative. Likewise, there's been this strong decline in the percent saying it's a moderate institution. 27% now say it's moderate. Almost double that, 50% said it was moderate back in 2019. Um, and so this shift again, I think reflects the real change in the membership of the court and the direction of its rulings, but it also shows that the image of the court as a more middle of the road body has largely gone away in favor of nearly two thirds of the public seeing it as having a conservative orientation. And a uh, partner question to that, we asked people their perception of what's shifted in the ideology of the court and found? That people see that shift as well. So in the first question we just asked, where would you say the Supreme Court is today? Very conservative, somewhat conservative, and so on. But in the second question we say, uh, sort of like the rights questions we did a minute ago, over the last 15 years or so, would you say the court has gotten much more conservative? 32% say much more conservative. Another 31% say somewhat conservative. 21% say it hadn't changed very much, and a somewhat puzzling 16% say it's gotten more liberal. Um, now, those folks may be thinking of individual decisions in which the court did take liberal positions, but uh, they might also be just a little confused about liberal and conservative. 
Um, the bottom line on this, though, is not only do our measures, based on where you see the court today, show a shift in perception over the times, the three years we've been doing this polling, but people's self-perception of how do they think the court has changed also is not just that they see it as conservative, but they see it as having moved in a conservative direction over time. And of course, conservatives applaud that movement while liberals bemoan it. Uh, I was just gonna say, in, in itself, that's an observation and not a partisan statement. Yes. So. Um, nine justices. We asked about people's impressions of each of them. Uh, what we do in this question is we introduce it by saying some justices are better known than others, so we invite people to say they haven't heard of a justice or they don't know enough about them. Um, I would think this is mildly disconcerting if you've reached the highest court in the land to learn that you're not universally known, but as a realist, realist in politics, it's hardly a surprise. The best known justices are Clarence Thomas. 63% of people have a favorable or an unfavorable view of him. And uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh at 60%. Uh, then it falls off quite a bit. The least known justice is Elena Kagan. Only 29% had an opinion of her. And 35%, the next lowest, is uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch. Um, Interestingly, Justice Breyer, who retired, was lower than Kagan, down around 22% who had an opinion of him. So um, I guess Justice He's Kagan has inherited the somewhat <laughs> dubious honor of being the least known justice. Um, we also then look at the net favorability towards the justices the percent favorable minus the percent unfavorable. And here it's pretty clear that the liberal justices have a more positive image with the public than the more conservative justices. Again, this is radically different if we look at favorability by your ideology. Conservatives like the conservatives, liberals like the liberals. But on balance for the public as a whole, Justice Sonia Sotomayor has a, the highest net positive at plus 20, and uh, the newest justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, at plus 13. Then the two at the low end, Justice Kavanaugh at minus 12 and Justice Thomas at minus 9. Notable that both of them are also the two best known justices. Um, and, you know, and then there are some others that are also negative as well. But, um, that sort of stands out. Now, again, so many people don't know much about the justices. That has to be our starting point. But when we look at what accounts for whether you have a favorable or unfavorable view of justices, it turns out that lines up pretty well with your partisanship and which party's president appointed the justices. And it also lines up with your liberal conservative ideology and the voting on the court, the ideology, if you will, the voting record of the justices. So again, there is no deep knowledge of the court in the public, but in a rough and ready way, people line up their impressions of the justices in ways that make sense given their partisanship and their ideology as well. And, of course, we also saw that with cases. A lot of people don't, aren't familiar with individual cases, but we saw when we looked at the expansion or contraction of rights that those things lined up relatively well with recent trends in the court. Let's focus for a moment on uh, Justice Jackson. She was in the spotlight earlier in 2022 when she was a nominee in front of the uh, senators and uh, uh, had very high profile at that point. What, the, what's become of her? <laughs> well, this is just to close on a somewhat light note, but this is the fate of a Supreme Court nominee. <laughs> they move from the nomination phase when they're fairly prominent to the sitting on the court phase when that prominence starts to fade as they're not in the news regularly. In uh, Justice Jackson's case, uh, when she was a nominee, 62% had an opinion about her. 
and that's now fallen to 41% today. Uh, that still puts her sort of in the middle uh, or even the upper middle of recognition in the court. Uh, but when we come back to this question in six months or a year, I think it's uh, quite possible that the effect of being the nominee will start to fade. We do see a little bit of this with the three justices that President Trump appointed to the court, that each of them had been better known recently, at, you know, when their confirmations had, had been in, in the news recently. And those numbers are now beginning to come down as well. Um, and so the fate of the justices is not to be a household name uh, every day. And maybe if you're in the news, uh, it has something to do with what the court has done. So uh, big picture thoughts here of all the justices. Uh, I believe the common perception is that the chief justice, uh, John Roberts, is the one who worries the most about the court standing in public opinion, the... Uh, the political legitimacy of the court, shall we say. What do these results say to his concerns? I think it's a complicated picture. I think one is that the court's reputation has <clears throat> suffered in the public eye over the last three or four years that we've been doing, three years that we've been doing the survey. Um, and you see it in both job approval, but you also see it in confidence in the court. I think a lot of that is from a major decision on abortion and maybe some others, but certainly the abortion decision right now, where the court took a position that went counter to a nearly two-thirds majority of the public's view. Justice Roberts made an argument recently that the court's legitimacy should not rest on individual cases and whether people agree or disagree with those decisions, that the way in which decisions are made, the considerations that lead to a decision are more important than the specific outcome. And I can see that from a judge's point of view or a justice's point of view, but from the public's point of view, outcomes matter a lot. And whether you support or oppose the direction of the court is going to have a lot to do with what those decisions look like. If we could go way back to the Warren Court in the 1960s, in a series of liberal rulings, conservatives were very unhappy with those outcomes and criticized them, even called for the impeachment of Chief Justice Earl Warren. Here we're in a conservative era on the court in which the conservative side is winning many cases, and the liberal side is losing, it's hardly a surprise if liberals are dissatisfied with those outcomes. The question of legitimacy of the court is a much more complicated one, but I'm not convinced that there's as clean a separation as the Chief Justice would like between disagreeing with the outcomes of the court and doubting the legitimacy of that court. And that is something that is only partly in the hands of the justices, though I would argue it is in their hands to the extent of how they write opinions, how they explain those decisions, um, and at the margin at least, maybe that can uh, temper the public's reaction to an outcome, but by explaining it in a way that supports the legitimacy of the court. That's an untested hypothesis. We'll continue polling on this and see uh, how these things change. As the abortion ruling itself fades into the background, but the issue is squarely before the uh, legislatures around the country. And we will have more to say on some of these issues and related issues in uh, the follow-up session, which will be coming uh, in uh, this case. This will be for Wednesday of this week, uh, September, where are we, 21st uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and and uh, the second session will be uh, released on Thursday, September 22nd. We'll shed more light at that time. Thank you to Professor Franklin for guiding us through these results. We'll be back with more 
And we appreciate your listening and hope we've been able to shed some light for you.